the most mystifying solar system facts. The solar system is 4.6 billion years old. So old, it's a senior solar system. Scientists came to this conclusion after they studied the oldest material they managed to get a hold of. And by that, I mean meteorites, of course. You won't be able to wear a hat on Venus, ever, and just try to stand on your feet. The planet is insanely windy. Its upper winds blow 50 times faster than the planet rotates. What's more, these fierce winds never stop and can get even stronger with time. Want to get away? You'll have to travel 11 billion miles away from Earth before ever leaving the solar system. Take your Google Maps with you. You probably heard of methane gas, a byproduct of natural processes such as volcanic activity and cows. Anyway, this gas is not only a part of the Martian atmosphere, but also the thing that confuses astronomers to no end. The thing is that the volume of methane on Mars keeps wavering, and scientists just can't figure out where it might be coming from. Can there be cows on Mars? As you may remember, Pluto used to be a planet but was stripped of this title in 2006. Later, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Gee, make up your mind! But the most unexpected fact about this celestial body is that its diameter is smaller than that of the US. See for yourself. The greatest distance across the country, from Maine to Northern California, is about 2,800 miles. As for Pluto, it's only 1,473 miles across. The planet Uranus, or Uranus, you can't win either way, rotates on its side, and astronomers have no idea why the planet has chosen such an unusual position. The culprits could be ancient mega-powerful collisions, but so far it's just a theory. By the way, this is the only planet laying on its side. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? Well, 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is in the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's 8 planets. Earth might not be the only tectonically active planet in the solar system. Astronomers have spotted some landforms looking like cliffs on Mercury. If it's so, the tectonic activity could explain the rapid shrinking of the planet. In most sci-fi movies about space, the main character gets into an asteroid belt and must dodge countless rocks that threaten to damage their spacecraft. Well, sorry to disappoint, but that's nothing like the real thing. The only asteroid belt astronomers know about is located between Mars and Jupiter. There are thousands of asteroids in this region, but they're so widely spaced that the chance of collision is next to nothing. Ah, you just ruined it. Sorry. Behind the orbit of Neptune lies the mysterious Kuiper Belt, filled with massive icy objects. The most curious thing about this space formation, though, is that scientists can't explain the pattern of its movement. The only explanation they have is that Neptune might be hiding a ginormous planet from our sight. This hypothetical planet has already got the name Planet 9, and all we have to do is wait until its existence is confirmed. Or not. Volcanoes on Earth are as different from those on Pluto as fire and ice, and I mean it. While we have volcanoes spilling lava on our planet, the volcanoes on Pluto spit ice. When frozen water expands, and this enormous pressure builds up until one day, bang, the ice erupts. In the process, a new cryovolcano gets formed. One of Saturn's moons, Lapidus, has a unique color. It's two-toned. One of its hemispheres is light and the other is eerily dark. Scientists haven't figured out this mystery yet. There's another weird thing about Pluto, or rather, about its atmosphere. First, it rises way higher above the surface of the dwarf planet than, for example, the Earth's atmosphere. What's more, the atmosphere on Pluto has more than 20 layers, and all of them are super cold and very condensed. We live inside the Sun. No, I don't mean that we're inhabitants of the red-hot ball of light approximately 93 million miles away. The thing is that the Sun's atmosphere stretches far beyond its visible surface, and our planet is right within its reach. In fact, it's the gusts of solar wind that create the breathtaking phenomenon 
known as the Northern and Southern Lights. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other on the rest of the solar system's planets. But wait! It's not the type of ocean you're thinking about. The one on Jupiter isn't made of water. This mesmerizing thing consists of metallic hydrogen, and its depth is a staggering 25,000 miles, which is almost the same as the circumference of the Earth. The Sun's atmosphere is hotter than the surface of the star. While on the surface, the temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. Scientists suspect that explosive bursts of heat from the Sun may have something to do with this unique phenomenon. People came to know about Saturn's beautiful rings in the 1600s. But only recently, it became apparent that Saturn isn't the only ringed planet. All the gas giant planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter, have rings of their own, but they're thin and almost impossible to see. As for Mars, Venus, and Earth, they're made of rocky materials and have no rings whatsoever. Our solar system isn't the only one in the Milky Way galaxy. Far from it. The galaxy we live in houses about 100 billion solar systems. And if that's just our galaxy alone, can you imagine how many there are in the whole universe? At any given moment here on Earth, you can stumble across a rock that's arrived from Mars. After scientists analyzed the chemical content of some meteorites found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and other places on our planet, they came to the shocking conclusion that they have a Martian origin. Since Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, many people simply assume that it's also the hottest. And that's where they get it wrong, because, in fact, Venus, which is about 30 million miles further from the Sun than Mercury, is way hotter. The thing is that Venus has an incredibly thick atmosphere, which is 100 times denser than the one we have on Earth. On top of that, this atmosphere consists almost entirely of carbon dioxide, also known as a greenhouse gas. These factors make the temperatures on the planet rise to a staggering 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt lead. As for Mercury, its maximum temperatures reach only 800 degrees. Jupiter's moon, Io, exists in never-ending chaos due to hundreds of smoking volcanoes on its surface. If you ever visit this place, send me a postcard. Now, you'll see the smoke from these volcanoes billowing up high into Lowe's atmosphere. The most enormous volcano in the whole solar system, at least that we know of, is on Mars. The size of this monster is almost as great as the state of Arizona, and its height is as big as that of Mount Everest. How did it grow this huge? The answer is simple. There's much less gravity on Mars in comparison with our planet. Even if you're a tiny celestial body, you can still have a moon of your own. Hey, it's not that hard. In 1993, the Galileo probe was traveling past a miniature asteroid that was no bigger than 20 miles across and discovered the little thing had a one-mile-wide moon. Since then, astronomers have found tons of moons orbiting minor planets in our solar system. The valley called Valles Marineris on Mars is more than 10 times larger than Earth's Grand Canyon. And it's another thing that puzzles astronomers. After all, Mars isn't a planet with active plate tectonics. On the surface of Jupiter, there's a weird region that's called the Great Red Spot. Recently, astronomers have concluded that this spot is actually a storm that's been raging on the planet for centuries. But some 20 years ago, scientists noticed that the red region started to shrink. Nowadays, it's just half the size it used to be. And still, the spot is one and a half times bigger than Earth. How about you? Do you know any other unusual facts about our solar system that I've missed? Then let me know down in the comments. If you learned something new today, then give this video a like and share it with a friend. But hey, don't go space traveling just yet! We have over 2,000 cool videos for you to check out. All you have to do is pick the left or right video, click on it, and enjoy. Stay on the bright side of life. Mercury gets a bad rap for always being hot, but that's not entirely true. The planet's got no atmosphere, so its temperature swings are wild. When it's facing the sun, it can get up to a blistering 800 degree Fahrenheit, but when it's turned away, it drops to a frigid minus 290 degrees. 
The reason for this is that Earth has a cozy atmosphere that keeps our temps in check. Mercury doesn't have that luxury, so it's at the mercy of the sun's rays. But despite all that, Mercury is still worth checking out. It's close to the sun, which makes it a prime spot for studying how solar radiation affects planets. And even though it's not exactly hospitable to life, there are still plenty of mysteries to unravel. Venus is often referred to as the sister planet of Earth. Yeah, many people believe that it's this beautiful and lush planet, just like our home. But boy are they wrong. In reality, Venus is a total diva. She's got this thick atmosphere that traps heat and causes surface temperatures to reach up to a scorching 864 degree Fahrenheit. I mean, I get it. Venus wants to stand out and be unique, but she's taken it to a whole new level. She's like that one friend who always has to one-up everyone else. Oh, you think Earth is cool? Well, I'm the only planet that spins clockwise. Beat that. But let's be real here. Venus is just trying too hard. She's got these crazy sulfuric acid clouds that rain down on her surface and make it impossible for anything to survive. It's like she's trying to keep all the attention for herself by making sure no other life forms can exist. And her atmosphere, so thick and heavy that it would crush us like a grape. So, yeah, Venus may look pretty from afar with her bright yellowish glow, but don't fall for that. She's a total drama queen who just can't handle sharing the spotlight with anyone else. Anyway, enough about Venus. Let's focus on the real star of the show, Earth. We may not have all the flashy features that Venus has, but at least we're hospitable and welcoming to all forms of life. Plus, we've got pizza. So who needs sulfuric acid clouds anyway? You may think that since we live on this planet, we know it from A to Z, and there is no room for any misconception. Alrighty, then tell me what shape is Earth? If you say it's round, sorry, but you're not right. So, our planet may look like a ball, but it isn't a perfect one. You see, because of the spinning action, the North and South Poles get squished a bit and they're sort of flat. The Earth's wobbling, and other stuff are actually causing it to change shape over time, but it's still roundish. Let's talk about Mars, the red planet that has fascinated humans for centuries. Now I know we all have this idea that Mars is this habitable planet that we can just pack our bags and move to if Earth becomes uninhabitable. Nope, that's not entirely true. One common misconception about Mars is that it has a breathable atmosphere. While Mars does have an atmosphere, it is much thinner than Earth's and consists mostly of carbon dioxide, making it unsuitable for human life without extensive life support systems. So if you're planning on taking a stroll on the surface of Mars, you better pack your oxygen tanks. But hey, that doesn't mean we should give up on our dreams of colonizing Mars. Who knows? Maybe in a few decades, we'll be able to call Mars our second home. Some people think Jupiter is a solid planet, but let me tell you, that's just a bunch of hot air. Literally. Jupiter is actually a gas giant made up mostly of hydrogen and helium. It's so massive that it doesn't even have a solid surface. I mean, I thought my bed was soft, but floating on a cloud of gas sounds pretty comfy too. Jupiter's atmosphere gradually transitions into its interior, which means it's like a never-ending party in there. Saturn's rings are one of the most fascinating features of the planet. So, a common misconception about Saturn is that its rings are solid. In reality, Saturn's rings are made up of countless small particles of ice and rock that orbit the planet. They stretch out over 174,000 miles from the planet's surface, but are only about 65 feet thick. The particles that make up the rings range in size from tiny specks of dust to large boulders. Scientists believe that the rings were formed from debris left over after the formation of Saturn and its moons. Over time, the particles were pulled in by Saturn's gravity and formed into the beautiful rings we see today. Saturn's rings also have some amazing features, such as gaps and divisions caused by the gravitational pull of nearby moons. There are also waves and spiral patterns that are created by the gravitational interactions between the particles in the rings. Despite their beauty, Saturn's rings are constantly changing. The particles collide with each other, creating new ones and breaking apart others. This means that the rings we see today may look very different in the future. So next time you look up at Saturn and its rings, 
remember that you're looking at a cosmic snow globe made up of billions of tiny particles floating around the planet. Now, one common misconception about Uranus is that it's a lazy dude who can't even rotate properly. People think it just rolls around on its side all day long, but let me tell you, that's not entirely true. Sure, Uranus does have a tilted axis of rotation, but it still manages to spin in the same direction as most other planets in our solar system. It's like that one friend who always shows up late to the party, but still manages to have a good time and fit in with the crowd. But let's be real, Uranus is still a bit of an oddball. It's the only planet in our solar system that rotates on its side to such a degree. But after all, variety is the spice of life, right? So cheers to Uranus, the planet that refuses to conform to anyone's expectations. Ugh, I wish I had the guts to be like this. Have you ever heard someone say that Neptune is just a blue version of Jupiter or Saturn? Well, let me tell you. That's like saying a banana is just a yellow version of a cucumber. It's not even close. Sure, Neptune and its gas giant buddies share some similarities, but Neptune stands out in the crowd with its beautiful blue hue. It's all thanks to the methane chilling in its atmosphere. By the way, did you know that it's the farthest planet from the sun? It's so far out there that it takes almost 165 Earth years for it to complete one orbit around the sun. Talk about taking your sweet time. And let's not forget about its 14 moons. That's right, Neptune has a whole entourage of moons following it around like groupies at a concert. Maybe they're hoping to catch a glimpse of Neptune's famous blue glow. So, next time someone tries to tell you that Neptune is just a knockoff version of Jupiter or Saturn, you can confidently correct them and say, excuse me, but Neptune is its own unique gas giant with a fancy blue vibe. Did you know that Pluto isn't actually considered a planet anymore? That's right, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decided to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet. So what exactly does that mean? Well, a dwarf planet is a celestial body that orbits the sun and is big enough to be rounded by its own gravity, but it hasn't cleared its orbit of other debris. It's a common misconception that Pluto is still considered a planet, but the truth is that it's just not big enough to make the cut. Sorry, Pluto. Don't worry, though. You may be small but you're still loved by many. Plus, being a dwarf planet is pretty cool too. You get to hang out with other celestial misfits like Ceres and Haumea. So keep on orbiting, Pluto. We still think you're out of this world. The sun's heat is beneath our feet. Scientists have figured out that Earth's core is actually as hot as the surface of the sun, around 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons it's so incredibly hot down there is because Earth is still shedding heat from when it was created billions of years ago. Also, when an object as big as Mars slammed into the young Earth, it not only created the moon, according to one theory, but melted the surface of the planet. A lot of that extra heat is probably still stored inside the core. But there's no need to worry. The planet's core is harder for us to access than it is to probe the surface of Pluto. In fact, chances are we may never develop technology that could physically reach the core. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks. But without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen. And hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But, Get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant. 
lasts 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system. At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, in the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small, you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. They can endure extreme cold and incredible heat, and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. Huh, that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core, small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool, 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core, and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. 
The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to sixty times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive 700 times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Saturn's rings are very thin compared to its size. If you had a scale model of the planet that was three feet wide, the rings would be 10,000 times thinner than a razor blade. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow, but not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. Not a great vacation spot. We've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet, and if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home. So let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same, four billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. 
the planet Kepler-22b is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth, and that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler-22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. And animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky, and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then, of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler-22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Kepler-22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler-22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler-22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler-22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, if Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life, but in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home while well, not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, 
We're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish, until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus, which is more toxic than your ex? Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source, because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet or something like that. It's the year 2600, and the new Frontiers program has finally begun. You've got the list of planets to plan dwellings for, and the first one is Venus. The Earth's evil twin sister meets you with a refreshing 800 degrees Fahrenheit and a beautiful sulfuric acid rainstorm. First of all, the heat means living on the surface here is next to impossible, so you immediately put the prospective house several dozen feet underground. The walls, floor, and ceiling must be made of some heat-resistant and durable material, so you make them out of hafnium carbide. Discovered way back in 2016, it withstands temperatures of over 7,000 degrees. Next, you install the air cooling and purification system. It captures the toxic air from the Venusian atmosphere and pulls it through a complex network of filters, delivering breathable air to the dwelling. As an added benefit, the temperature of this air can be easily turned up thanks to what's going on outside. You can create a separate room below the main space and dub it the generator room. The device there will use the almost infinite geothermal energy of the planet to provide the house with electricity. You think for a moment and add a geothermal bathroom as well. There's no water on Venus, but it can be extracted and separated from its acidic clouds. The piping system would include a heating unit for hot water and a cooling unit with liquid nitrogen for cold water. Another separate space is the garden. Since no plants can survive on the surface, you create a spacious hall with bright lights on the ceiling and a sprinkler system throughout the area. You have large patches of soil for vegetables, several acres for fruit plants, and a big patch in the center for a couple of long-living trees like oaks. They'll provide additional oxygen for the whole building. The garden is encased in a shell of hafnium carbide as well, so that the plants don't wilt in the excess heat of the Venusian soil. You check if everything's accounted for and go to your next stop. Saturn. It's a gas planet, but there's a thin yet stable layer that can be called the sweet spot. Its temperature is just right for humans to feel fine. You create a hover platform to build your house on. There's just no solid ground on Saturn at all. The platform's equipped with wind-powered turbines. The winds on the gas giant reach incredible speeds, so it will need to counteract them, at the same time feeding from the hurricanes. The pressure and temperature are just about right in this place, so your main concern is the wind again. You make the dwelling low and looking almost like a frisbee for better aerodynamics. The walls and roof are made from a single slab of sturdy metal so that powerful gusts can't tear the roof away. You also make them several feet thick and add some windows with space-grade glass panes that won't break. Water can be extracted from another layer using a series of similar platforms with built-in pipes. Electricity and heat are no problem either, thanks to the powerful winds. The only problem here is food, but it can be imported from other inhabited planets at first, 
along with the fertile soil for the garden. You'll create a space for it on another hover platform for the future. Satisfied with your results, you head to the next destination on your list, Europa. This moon of Jupiter's is covered in a miles-thick crust of ice full of canyons and crevices. But deep below, there's a whole ocean of salt water bigger than all the oceans on old Earth taken together. You take it into account and go for an underground dwelling again. The temperature is freezing, but the closer you are to the hot planetary core, the warmer it is. You place the dwelling as deep as you can to safely extract water from the underground ocean. The walls and ceiling are padded with insulation, and in the cellar, there's a home water purification system that turns salty water into the potable kind. Since there's no atmosphere to speak of, the breathable air is extracted from the ice. As it melts, the water vapor is collected and filtered, then enriched with other necessary substances and delivered to the dweller. As for food, you go for an unusual solution – edible marine plants and fish. You create a separate tank to cultivate algae right in the ocean, and different kinds of fish can be imported from old Earth and other inhabited planets to breed on Europa. Next stop? Pluto. The tiny dwarf planet, just one-sixth of old Earth in width, has a great potential for terraforming. So you immediately create a big dome for your dwelling. The sun shines much weaker here than in any other place in the solar system, so you make sunlight-enhancing panels all across the dome. They'll allow the surface underneath to receive more light and warmth, bringing the area to a comfortable temperature. The ice on Pluto consists of frozen water, just like on Earth. So you build a station for melting it and collecting the resulting liquid into large tanks for later use. There's also a possible liquid ocean deep under the surface. So you add a deep drilling platform, but put a question mark on it. You don't know if it's going to be useful yet. With the area warmed up and well lit, you make a pretty ordinary dwelling like ones we're used to on old Earth and terraform Mars. A couple of stories, carbon or titanium alloyed walls and ceiling for durability, and a fortified cellar. Still, you also add emergency insulation padding that will only trigger if something happens to the lighting dome. If it's breached, the temperature will quickly drop to below freezing. There's also very little atmosphere on Pluto, so breathable air will have to be generated from the ice again. This time, you combine the water collecting system with the air generating facility. While one produces potable water, the other will collect vapor and enhance it with all the necessary elements. You even go as far as to create a weather controlling device. It will heat up or cool down different layers of the produced air and mix them together to create winds and rain clouds just like on old Earth. This will allow crops to grow in a more natural environment, and Pluto might even become a green planet one day. Right above, in the dark blue sky, Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, is hanging. It's half the dwarf planet in size, which makes it a spectacular view. Its climate is almost identical to that of Pluto's. In a fit of inspiration, you create a vacation home for Plutonians. Here, under a similar dome, they'll be able to explore another little world and look at their dwarf planet from the other side. Which is always the same side, by the way, like the Earth's moon, which reminds you of the next destination. Zarmina, previously known as Gliese 581g, is 41 light years away, the longest trip so far. The planet's tidally locked to its sun, which means there's perpetual day on its one side and eternal night on the other. It's not only about light, but heat as well. The day side is much hotter, and the night side is partially covered in ice. Unless we terraform the planet, the most comfortable area to inhabit is right between the two sides, called the Terminator Zone. It's neither too hot nor too cold here, and there's an eternal twilight. The sun is always just above the horizon. The good news is that the atmosphere on Zarmina, although volatile, is rather close to the old Earth's. But you still cover the selected area with a protective dome just in case. Human dwellings here don't have to be specially protected from the elements. And there's liquid water, too. You build a pretty generic house, much like the one on Pluto, but then add a few crucial details. First, the weather controlling device. Despite the old Earth-like atmosphere, dwellers will need a stable change of weather to grow crops. Then you cover the dome with moving plates. Living in a constant dust might be pretty depressing, so the plates will move in 12-hour patterns. During the daytime, they will turn to enhance the sunlight, 
while at night, they'll deflect it back, making the sky dark. After that, you travel to both edges of the terminator zone and install geothermal plants. On the hot side, the plant will generate energy for all the settler's needs and take hot water to use in households. On the cold side, the system will make cold water for the ice. The night side can also be used as a giant refrigerator. Dwellers could store things they need frozen here. To make it easier to access, you stretch the dome from edge to edge and create some simple storage facilities where the night begins in earnest. We've been focusing on trying to find life on Mars so much, while there is this gem waiting to be explored. This planet is the sixth farthest from the Sun and the second largest in the solar system. You'll find it right behind Jupiter. I'm talking about Saturn, or as they sometimes call it, the jewel of the solar system. It's so different from our planet. First of all, you wouldn't be able to stand there. While Earth consists of rock and other tough stuff, this planet is like a giant ball, mostly made of gases. If you found a swimming pool huge enough to fit Saturn, you could see the planet floating in the water. No wonder, Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It also contains a lot of helium. You know, the gas you put in balloons to make them hover in the air. Saturn is a very windy planet. Winds there are more than four times stronger than the ones we have on Earth. A day over there lasts 10 hours and 14 minutes because Saturn spins on its axis pretty fast. But the planet takes its time while going around the Sun. A year there equals 29 Earth years. Saturn's radius is more than 36,000 miles. It means the gas giant is nine times wider than our planet. If Earth was the size of a nickel, Saturn would be as big as a volleyball. Even though some of our planets in our solar system also have rings, Saturn's are the most spectacular ones. You can even see its rings from Earth. And no, you don't have to be a scientist with insanely expensive equipment. All you need is a small telescope. Saturn's rings are not firm. They are made of pieces of dust, rock, and ice. Some of them are as small as grains of sand, and some as big as a house or even a mountain. These are actually bits of asteroids, comets, and shattered moons that fell apart before reaching Saturn. They could be torn into pieces by the planet's powerful gravitational pull. Saturn has over 50 moons, and recently, scientists have discovered some unusual hydrothermal activity on one of them. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth biggest moon. It has four tiger stripes close to one of its poles. Researchers have found that there is an ocean underneath these stripes. Water and ice erupt from that area. So now, we can't but wonder, maybe there's life out there. In the oceans on Earth, some forms of life gather around similar hydrothermal vents. They feed on the chemicals there, same as plants on the surface do with sunlight. And not only that, some of the oldest microbial life on our planet feed on the same energy as the one produced beneath the ocean's surface on Enceladus. It could potentially mean there's life developing there right now. Of course, it takes millions and millions of years for even the simplest organisms to appear. But hopefully, scientists will need less time to find more complex forms of life. There are millions of exoplanets out there in space, and scientists have been searching for those that could be potentially habitable. Exoplanets are planets orbiting a star outside of our solar system. Dwarf stars are similar, less luminous than the Sun. They sometimes live for more than 10 billion years. That's enough time for a living organism to develop and evolve into a more complex form. Life might appear on the planets orbiting such dwarf stars, or, like with Saturn, on one of their moons. And here it is, Gliese 876b, that orbits the red dwarf star Gliese 876. This planet is mostly a mystery, but scientists assume this is a gas giant that has no solid surface. They believe its atmosphere doesn't have clouds but there might be water in its liquid form on the planet's surface. T. Gardens b orbits a red dwarf that's around 12 light years away from our solar system. The planet's mass is just a bit higher than that of Earth. Scientists think it may have a rocky surface. The planet needs around five days to complete its orbit. It means that one year on T. Gardens b is actually shorter than one week on Earth. Somewhere far, far away, there's another potentially habitable planet named Kepler-1638b. Okay, to be more precise, it's 3,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. This planet is four times as heavy as Earth and twice as wide. It needs almost 260 days to complete one orbit around its star. The gravity on this planet is stronger than that on Earth. 
it wouldn't be an easy feat to jump on its surface. One more Kepler coming along. This time, it's Kepler-62e, a planet that's more than one and a half times the size of Earth. Scientists believe this one has a warm, humid, and hospitable atmosphere with cloudy skies. There are 1,200 light years between Earth and this planet. Kepler-62e needs 122 days to orbit its red dwarf star. Its neighbor, Kepler-62f, is another potentially habitable zone. It's a world around 40% bigger than Earth. Scientists think this planet might be covered in water. The oceans on our planet are full of interesting creatures and organisms of all sizes. So the chances are, this planet also hides some intriguing living beings, or at least, it has the potential to develop life. When we say habitable, it doesn't mean life definitely exists there. It just means there are conditions for some forms of life to develop. LHS 1140b is a planet located in one of the potentially habitable zones. Unlike its gas companions, it's solid and quite rocky. The planet's radius is 60% larger than that of Earth, and its mass is seven times bigger. It's one of the densest planets found out there. Since the planet has a big mass, an atmosphere there must be rather thick. Plus, gravity on its surface is much stronger than here on Earth. That's why you would likely have problems just standing on that planet. Hello and greetings from TRAPPIST-1, an ultra-cool dwarf in the constellation Aquarius. It's around 39 light years away from us. Seven Earth-sized rocky planets are orbiting in the star's habitable zone. All of them can potentially have some water on their surfaces. The temperature on these planets is more or less similar to that on Earth. On the Moon, gravity is only 16% of what we have on our home planet. That's why the astronauts could hardly control their movements when they visited our natural satellite. But when it comes to the gravity on TRAPPIST-1 planets, you would probably feel good and comfortable there. And Kepler, once again. This time, it's Kepler-452b. It's a rocky planet 60% larger than Earth. Its parent star is similar to our Sun. This planet has actually spent around 6 billion years in the habitable zone, while Earth has been there for a mere 4.5 billion years. This planet needs 385 days to orbit Kepler-452. This star is around 20% brighter than our Sun, but has the same temperature. The whole system is very far from our little oasis. It would take you 28 million years to get there. And now, how about KOI 7711.01? It's another intriguing world 1,700 light years away from us. This planet is only 30% bigger than Earth. It gets almost the same amount of heat as we receive from our Sun. Sometime in the future, people might start colonizing the galaxy. They would be looking for new planets to live on then we'd certainly have to make really long trips. And maybe one day, we'd reach Proxima Centauri. It's a nearby star that has a couple of planets we could potentially inhabit, like Proxima Centauri b. It's around four light years away from Earth, and it doesn't sound that far at first, but it actually is. It would take about 6,300 years to travel there, if we use the technologies that are available these days. It would mean many, many generations to make a trip like that and it would take even longer to finally inhabit that new world. People would be born and raised on spaceships. They would live their lives there without ever seeing either Earth or the planet they're heading to. Instead of trees, mountains, and rivers, there would be only the dark nothingness of faraway galaxies spreading in front of them. They would never be able to wander unknown streets, breathe in the fresh air, feel the wind. The only place for them to travel to would be another part of the ship. Certainly, such a journey wouldn't be simple, but it would pay off if people managed to build some more beautiful worlds, like the one we have here on Earth. Is that even possible? Time will tell. You know, many different things have nothing in common at first glance. The appearance of mysterious clouds over Stonehenge and the migration of wolves in Canada. Patterns on the wings of a Caribbean butterfly and strange footprints on the moon's surface. These are all random facts but people can see connections in these events. Let's see how it can happen and where it can lead to. Imagine reading some crazy article on one of the unreliable sites, forgetting about it, and then beginning to notice small details in the world that might indicate that the information in this article is true. You realize you've learned something unusual. But for some reason, other people don't see it or don't want to see it. You try to tell them, but no one wants to listen to you. 
And some people even think you've gone mad. Let's stop for a moment and see what kind of article you've read. So, in 2017, one not-so-truthful site published a story about a ship from another planet called Black Knight that had been spying on people for 12,000 years. But not long ago, agents from a secret organization managed to destroy it. Sounds like absolute nonsense or a plot for a cheap sci-fi movie. Of course you don't believe it. But a few years later, you find a story about Nikola Tesla. Let's fast forward to 1899. The famous scientist was sitting in his laboratory in Colorado Springs, conducting radio experiments. Suddenly, his receiver caught a strange radio signal. Then, after a while, another one. The signals came in with the same time interval, as if someone wanted to send a message. Nikola Tesla realized it could be something from extraterrestrial civilizations that were trying to start a dialogue with people using the most universal language, math. He also reported about this event in a magazine at the beginning of the 20th century and added that he hadn't deciphered the message. Okay, now, let's forget about it and see what happened next. In 1927, an engineer from Oslo, who was fond of radio devices, was sending signals into open space. He was surprised when, sometime later, the same signals began to return to his receiver. It was as if the signals bounced off something big and echoed back, or something received these messages and then sent them back to the sender to make an acquaintance. The man quickly reported his discovery to scientific journals, and perhaps someone connected this event with Nikola Tesla's words about strange signals from space. All this were just prerequisites for the Black Knight. But the most exciting events started decades later. In the 60s, Time magazine published an article that said that the U.S. had discovered a satellite orbiting Earth and using unknown technology. A couple of years later, Project Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper reported that he had seen a strange object during his spaceflight. But the Black Knight became really famous only in the late 90s when NASA published a series of images of a mysterious object. During the first flight to the ISS, astronauts noted weirdly shaped somethings and took several pictures. Then someone gathered all the facts, collected all the information about the black satellite, and discovered that it had been flying around our planet for more than 10,000 years. How did they figure it out? People managed to calculate the age of those radio signals that Tesla and the engineer had received. If this is true, the Black Knight appeared much earlier than the Sumerians in ancient Egypt. What if this satellite helped build pyramids and majestic temples? What if it had been watching over our development all this time and transmitting this information to another planet? What if mysterious images ancient people drew depicted the satellite? People began to suspect NASA and other space agencies of hiding information about the black object to prevent panic. And now, after having received all the data about the mysterious satellite, you might begin to suspect that the bizarre article may actually be true. This news is so improbable and ridiculous that no one will believe it. If you want to hide something, hide it in plain sight. And so, together with other enthusiasts, you start hunting for any information about the mysterious ship. You create forums, post photos of unknown objects, and become obsessed with this topic. You really believe in the reality of the Black Knight. Moreover, you don't want to question its existence. And people reading your articles do the same. Congratulations! You have become an ideal candidate for creating fake news in the yellow press. Such myths and urban legends seem attractive. The human brain feels pleasure when it finds fake secret information. The feeling of mystery, adrenaline, and shock can cause psychological addiction. That's why the stories about the Black Knight are still alive. Mysterious facts seem logical, and people stop seeing information that refutes their theories. The case of the Black Knight is no exception. The fans of this black object believe that Nikola Tesla received signals from some space civilization. But for some reason, they don't attach importance to scientific articles, which say that such radio signals could be sent by giant space objects like pulsars. A pulsar is a rotating neutron star emitting powerful electromagnetic radiation. Such radiation is often found in space. 
These radio waves don't imply the presence of a mind and a sender. The cosmos is full of such signals. The technology for detecting such objects were created in the 60s. Or maybe Tesla's device caught a signal coming from our planet. Besides, the scientists didn't see anything about the Black Knight. So why did people connect these two events? That story with the Norwegian engineer is still unexplained. Yes, his signals returned as an echo. But this had nothing to do with the flying object in question either. You might as well say that the satellite somehow influenced the Titanic. There's no logic in such assumptions. Strangely, no one connected the Black Knight with the Yeti or the Kraken. Now, let's return to that Times article about a strange object flying around Earth. It also stated it was a fragment of an American reconnaissance satellite. But fans of myths and legends apparently didn't notice this explanation. As for astronaut Cooper, who was said to spot some object during his mission, he actually saw nothing. He even showed a transcript with no reports about the black satellite. However, some believers in other civilizations keep silent about this fact. So, the main proof of the Black Knight's existence is the photos taken during the first flight to the ISS. The astronauts noticed this strange object and took pictures. But it wasn't a surprise for them, because some part of the ship broke away during some work they did outside. It was a piece of thermal coating. The astronauts sent the photo to NASA, and the space agency assigned it a personal number, as it does with all such objects. A few days later, the Black Knight fell out of orbit and burned up in Earth's atmosphere. Almost all this information was recorded in official protocols. One of NASA's engineers, who knew the photographer of the Black Satellite, explained that those famous photos depicted an ordinary piece of the ship. There was nothing fantastic about it. But the fans of extraterrestrial rockets must have missed all this information. All these myths have long been debunked and all the false facts have been refuted. But the Black Knight continues to live in many people's minds and on the pages of the Yellow Press. It has become a link between many reports of strange flying objects. Over the years, hundreds of stories have appeared about secret laboratories with extraterrestrial technologies, about NASA hiding secrets, and about creatures from other planets. And many people connected these myths with the Black Satellite. It has stopped being a real physical object. Now it's a cultural phenomenon. Remember how the main symbol of extraterrestrial civilizations was a flying saucer? It's not trending anymore. Today, the symbol is a black, weirdly shaped stone. Don't be fooled. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind. The Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. 
The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week, and it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. 
Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. Colonizing other planets is like the ultimate cosmic adventure. It's a challenge that's captured the imagination of humans for centuries, and it's something we've always dreamed of doing. One of the most popular candidates for this role is Mars. And this isn't surprising. Mars is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in many ways, and it even has evidence of water on its surface. This makes it a prime candidate for human colonization. Many scientists and engineers are working on plans to send humans to Mars and establish a permanent settlement there. But what about the other candidates? There are many planets and moons in our solar system, so why not colonize something else? For example, Ceres. Ceres is the ultimate cosmic treasure trove. It's a dwarf planet, not a full-fledged one, just like Pluto. It's located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This dwarf planet is the closest to the Sun, and it's adorably tiny. The entire planet is about the same size as the state of Texas. So why choose it? Because Ceres may be a rich source of valuable resources. The surface of Ceres is covered in craters and other geological features. And scientists believe that beneath its surface, it has a thick layer of water ice, which means that deep underground, it may have an ocean of liquid water. If this is true, Ceres could be a valuable resource for future space missions. It could potentially provide a source of water for human exploration of the solar system. So, can we colonize it? And if so, how do we do that? Actually, many scientists and space enthusiasts have proposed this idea. To colonize Ceres, we'd have to use the same methods used to establish colonies on the Moon, Mercury, and the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Don't worry, it's not that hard. We just need to figure out how to adapt to a very thin atmosphere, to extreme temperatures, and pressure, and, well, all the other nasty stuff. But let's stay hopeful. At the end of the day, it all comes down to resources. We'll need water, minerals, silica, and other raw materials. All this would help us to create a self-sufficient colony. And luckily, Ceres is full of these things. So first of all, we could locate the places of residence inside the craters of Ceres. We could build domes there that would protect us from all sorts of dangerous things, like radiation. We could also mine regolith in the asteroid belt. Regolith is a residual soil that appears as a result of cosmic weathering of the rock. Basically, it's something like the surface layer of soil on the moon. Why do we need it? Well, 
because we could use it to 3D print the base layers next to the ice so that our bases would be located near the water. We could then use these base layers to print other structures, like houses. We could also collect ice and organic molecules to create water. And by combining water with regolith, we would get soil in which we could grow plants and food. Wonderful! There's also another option. A colony could be created underground. That is, right next to the icy crust of the planet. Now, if in the future we'll be some kind of super cool scientists, we could try to accelerate the rotation of Ceres, which sounds crazy, but would be pretty beneficial. It would help us to create artificial gravity inside the underground colonies. And speaking of gravity, all of these things may sound cool, but let's discuss the difficulties that lie ahead of us during colonization. To colonize Ceres, we would need to overcome a number of challenges. To begin with, we need to develop technologies that will help us even get to Ceres. We need some kind of ships that would be capable of long flights into deep space. For them, first we need to create some kind of nuclear thermal or nuclear electric traction, and maybe an even more advanced type of fuel. Then we'll also need technology to help us sustain life in this small rocky world. That is, tools to extract and use local resources. Also, since there's no atmosphere on Ceres, we would have to wear spacesuits and live in pressurized habitats. And this is only the beginning. Living on the planet itself won't be an easy task either. For example, what about extreme temperatures or radiation? or the mentioned incredibly weak gravity. The latter is definitely one of the biggest problems. The gravity of Ceres is only 3% of the Earth's. You wouldn't want to accidentally fly into outer space while playing football, would you? But the fact that any jump could send you on an endless journey isn't the only problem. Even if you somehow stay on the surface of the planet, you'll experience the same symptoms and problems as astronauts who hang out on the International Space Station. For example, loss of muscle mass, decrease in bone density, deterioration of vision, problems with the cardiovascular system. Wow, who would have thought that gravity is so important? So therefore, if we wanted to survive on Ceres, we would need either a bunch of doctors or some kind of artificial gravity. And don't even get me started on how low gravity will slow down production and work. And of course, we can't go anywhere without discussing money. Colonizing Cirrus would cost us a huge expense, especially taking into account all of the above. And yet, despite all these things, Cirrus still stays one of the best candidates for colonization. For example, Cirrus contains lots of methane and ammonia. They can be used as a manufactured fuel or a nitrogenous gas. Or you can just mine it there in order to colonize Mars and Venus. Even low gravity has its advantages. Thanks to it, it will be very easy to launch spacecraft from Ceres. We'll waste much less fuel, which means that transportation from Ceres to other planets would be much cheaper and more efficient. So, even if Ceres doesn't become our permanent residence, it can become a good transport hub, something like a spaceport. We could use it as a base for mining all sorts of useful things from the asteroid belt. Then, we could transport all these resources back to Mars or Earth. And it can also become a refueling station for ships traveling further beyond the solar system. Sounds cool and pretty sci-fi-ish, doesn't it? But it seems that any attempts to create a permanent base in the asteroid belt will have to wait. Colonizing other planets is a difficult and complex task. It'll require the cooperation and expertise of many different people, and it will involve developing new technologies and overcoming many challenges. Before we go to Ceres, we need to build infrastructures on the Moon, Mars, and somewhere in between. Otherwise, any attempts to colonize it would be prohibitively expensive and would most likely fail before future missions could even reach it. But the more colonies we create, 
the more likely it is that sooner or later, we'll build another one on Ceres. This would not only open the asteroid belt to economic exploitation, it would also serve as a stepping stone to the outer solar system. This, in turn, could lead to colonizing the moons of Jupiter and beyond. In other words, the rewards of colonizing Ceres could be great. Not only would it allow us to explore and understand this fascinating world, but it could also provide us with valuable resources that could help us to further explore and settle the solar system. Life on Ceres would likely be challenging, but exciting, as humans would be making a new home for themselves and exploring the mysteries of the universe. Just imagine all the new planet-themed restaurants and shops we could have. Welcome to Ceres Mart, where everything is out of this world! So, if you're a fan of cosmic treasure hunts, Ceres is surely a rich and rewarding destination. Just make sure you bring some weights on your feet so you don't fly anywhere. Ah, uh, what a nice cosmic family. Meet Mars. I bet you've met him before. These two little guys are Phobos and Deimos, Mars' small moons. But it seems like Mars isn't treating the little ones the right way. Phobos and Deimos are believed to be captured asteroids. However, Phobos is gradually moving closer to Mars due to gravity, and it is predicted that it will eventually be destroyed by the planet's gravity within the next 35 million years. I won't be around then. So, I imagine this will result in a ring of debris around Mars, similar to Saturn's rings. However, this process is a natural phenomenon and not an act of destruction by Mars. Apparently, Phobos is getting ripped apart by the crazy gravitational forces of the red planet. But wait, there's more! Phobos has these crazy parallel grooves all over its surface. We used to think that they were from an asteroid crash, but now scientists think they're actually from Mars's intense gravity pulling the moon apart. Talk about a rough ride! Scientists have this wild idea that when a little guy like Phobos gets too close to a big guy like Mars, it starts to stretch out towards it. They call it the tidal force. Phobos is predicted to get stretched out so much that it'll actually break apart. Crazy, right? And the debris from the moon will form a tiny ring around Mars, just like Saturn's rings. Now, some people thought that Phobos' tiger stripes were caused by tidal forces before, but that theory got shut down because the moon is just too darn fluffy. But now, these genius researchers ran some computer simulations and found out that maybe there's a hard shell underneath all that fluff that could create grooves on the surface. But don't worry. At the rate Phobos is going, it's going to crash into Mars in about 40 million years. But if tidal forces are already tearing it apart, it might not even last that long. However, we'll still have the chance to learn more about Phobos. NASA just picked 10 rock star researchers from all over the US to join the science working team for JAX's Martian Moons Exploration or just MMX mission. As NASA supported participating scientists, they'll be helping JAXA explore the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. And get this, they're even planning to land on Phobos and grab a surface sample. The mission is set to launch in 2024, and we'll get our hands on that sample in 2029. Seven of the lucky researchers will be using the MMX flight instruments to conduct their research. Phobos is a real oddball. It's only 17 miles wide and orbits Mars at a distance of 3,728 miles, to be precise. Now that's way closer than Earth's moon, which takes a whole 27 days to orbit us. But Phobos is in a death spiral toward Mars and is slowly falling towards the planet's surface at a rate of 6 feet every 100 years. But there must be a reason why Mars is acting that nastily, right? What if it's all just because of plain vengeance? Well, okay, picture this. Mars is minding its own business, being all hot and watery like a young Earth. It's got a sweet magnetic field that's protecting it from cosmic radiation and keeping its atmosphere nice and thick. Hey, life is good. But then, at least 20 asteroids, each the size of a small country, come crashing down on Mars like a giant game of cosmic whack-a-mole. One of them even leaves a crater that's almost 2,000 miles wide. Now imagine how Mars must feel with two asteroids being its moons 
after what other asteroids did to the red planet. All these impacts are like a massive punch to Mars' gut, and its already weak magnetic field is knocked out cold. The core gets all overheated and can't circulate properly, which means no more magnetic field to protect the planet. It's like as if you were wearing nothing at the depth of the Mariana Trench. If it were possible, you'd be defenseless and chilly. It's basically what happened to Mars. So now poor Mars is out there in the cold, unprotected from all those nasty cosmic rays. It's like going outside without sunscreen. Not a good idea. But at least we can learn from Mars's mistakes and make sure Earth doesn't have the same fate. Maybe we should start investing in some asteroid insurance. <laughs> but trust me, the red planet isn't mean at all. It's actually pretty friendly. While Mars may seem to be pretty tough for Phobos, there's something that might be thriving with Mars' help. So get this. A team of scientists found a way to grow rice on Mars. Yep, you heard me right. They used MMS, not the outdated way to send pictures, but a special soil called Mojave Mars Simulant. It's supposed to mimic Martian soil. And here's the catch. Martian soil has these nasty percolate salts that can be toxic for plants. So the team grew three types of rice, one normal and two gene-edited with mutations that make them better at handling stress like drought or salinity. And guess what? The mutant strains were able to root in soil with one gram of percolate per kilometer. Take that, Martian soil. But hold up. The rice grown in the MMS didn't turn out as great as the ones grown in regular potting soil. So the team decided to mix a quarter of the potting soil with the Martian simulant, and looky there, the plants started developing better. Now these scientists aren't just thinking about feeding Martians. They also want to see if their findings can help grow crops in places on Earth with high salinity. And get this, the whole project started when two researchers met for coffee and decided to try growing plants together. Well, isn't that nice? I suspect you're about to say, hey! But if you want to grow rice on Mars, you'll have to ship insane amounts of water from Earth, and it's not easy to quench this plant's thirst. You're right. You need about 449 gallons of water to only grow a pound of rice. But guess what? Scientists made a groundbreaking announcement at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. They found a relic glacier near Mars' equator. That's right, water ice on Mars, even near the equator. This is huge news, and could mean there's even more ice just below the surface. It's not just any glacier, it's a relic glacier that's estimated to be 3.5 miles long and up to 2.5 miles wide. It's like the size of a small town. It's got all the features of a glacier, including crevasse fields and moraine bands. But get this, it's not actually ice. It's a salt deposit that formed on top of the glacier while preserving its shape. So, how did this salt deposit form? Well, it turns out that volcanic materials blanketing the region might have something to do with it. When these materials come into contact with water ice, sulfate salts may form and build up into a hardened, crusty layer. Over time, erosion removed the volcanic materials, exposing the sulfates and revealing the glacier's unique features. This glacier is young, likely from the Amazonian geologic period. That means that Mars has had surface ice in recent times. Who knows what other icy secrets Mars is hiding? But hold your horses, there's still more research to be done. Scientists need to figure out if there's still water ice preserved underneath the salt deposit, or if it has disappeared entirely. And if there is still water ice at shallow depths near the equator, that could have major implications for human exploration. Imagine being able to extract water from the ground at a warmer location. That would be a game-changer. So let's see what else these scientists uncover about our favorite red neighbor. Maybe someday, we'll even get to visit that salt glacier statue in person. See you next time! Imagine something terrible happening to Earth and humans having to leave it as fast as possible. And you have to decide which planet will become your new home. Which one will you pick? Probably the first planet that comes to mind is Mars. It's relatively close. Like Earth, it's also a rocky planet. It even has an atmosphere, even though it's much thinner than what we have on our planet. 
But at the same time, the North Pole on Earth would seem balmy to you in comparison to Mars. On the red planet, the average temperature is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. The most radioactive areas on our home planet might seem harmless if you compare them with the surface of Mars. But what if we terraform Mars? Could we keep transforming the red planet until it becomes capable of supporting human life? It would be an enormous feat. Mars is an extremely dangerous place. Should you teleport there right now, without any protective suit or anything, the gas in your blood would instantly turn into bubbles. You can probably imagine the consequences. Add oxygen deprivation, cold exposure, and radiation poisoning to the equation, and well, who's next? If we still decided to terraform Mars, we would need to create a stronger magnetosphere. We've got this protective magnetic layer on Earth. It shields us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. The red planet would also need a thicker atmosphere, again for protecting us from harmful space stuff better. Right now, the Martian atmosphere is almost entirely composed of carbon dioxide with tiny amounts of oxygen. For us to live there comfortably, Mars would also need to be warmer. And if we managed to somehow warm the planet up, we'd also be able to release frozen carbon dioxide. At the moment, there are vast reserves of this gas at the red planet's polar caps and other areas. It would help the atmosphere to become thicker, making it possible for water to exist on the surface of the planet. Right now, there is some water on Mars. The atmosphere of the red planet is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form. But under the surface of the planet, it's a different matter. You can find water under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere. But it only exists as vapor. If liquid water existed on the surface of the planet, it would make it easier for us to start growing plants. And plants, in turn, would begin to produce oxygen. But first of all, we would need to start the warming process. How? Well, Elon Musk suggests using nuclear energy to make Mars more livable. He says it could be done by creating a continuous flow of low-fallout nuclear fusion explosions above the atmosphere of the planet. Hmm. It could create something like numerous artificial suns. It could warm the planet, melting the frozen ice caps, which would then thicken the atmosphere, causing even more warming. Other strategies for Martian global warming include the diversion of asteroids into the poles of the planet, or the large-scale production of greenhouse gases that could help us heat the red planet. Or we could create a giant space mirror, as huge as the side of Mars. It would reflect tons of additional sunlight onto the planet. The problem is all these projects would have exorbitant costs. They would also require serious upgrades in our technological capabilities. Could there be an easier and cheaper way of terraforming the red planet? It seems so. Casey Hanmer used to work in NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now he's the founder of a startup hoping to create carbon-negative natural gas by pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere of our planet. He's also made a proposal to terraform Mars for a modest $10 billion. Mmm, sounds alluring. So, what is his idea? Mass-produced small solar sails. These are already existing technologies, even though they appeared only recently. Such sails use sunlight to propel themselves, like ships use the wind to sail. These solar sails could be launched into low Earth orbit, and after that, they would fly themselves to Mars. There, they would reflect sunlight onto the night side of the planet. According to Hanmer's calculations, a decade of such launches could result in a 1% increase in temperature on Mars. Hanmer also believes that we could mass-produce solar cells at cell phone factories. All because a solar sail would need a processor, a camera for navigation, and some electronics to be able to transmit data, just like a smartphone. In other words, Solar sails would be like small satellites using cell phone technology. Each of these sails would also need a sail of its own, 
a thin space blanket weighing about 2 pounds. When unfurled, it would span around the size of two basketball courts. Would this plan involving solar sails enable people to terraform Mars? Hanmer doesn't think so. Even if we put loads of money into solar sails, they would only make the red planet warmer and more humid, but they still wouldn't be enough to make Mars suitable for human life. Most scientists are also very skeptical about the very idea of terraforming this cold, dry world. They say that carbon dioxide and water vapor are the only greenhouse gases present on Mars. But there's just not enough of them to change the situation. Let's say we manage to melt the polar ice caps with the help of Elon Musk nuclear technology or solar sails. And still, this ice will only release enough carbon dioxide to bring the atmospheric pressure to 1.2% of what it is on Earth. Plus, most of the carbon dioxide gas wouldn't be accessible, and we wouldn't be able to mobilize it. Even if we decided to go through an energy-intensive process of the extraction of carbon dioxide from the planet's soil, dust, and minerals, we'd still only get the atmosphere to a mere 5% of where it needs to be. Water is another problem. It is salty on Mars. It might even be as salty as the oceans on our planet. But these salts aren't what you find on Earth. If a person consumed a certain amount of them, they would be highly toxic to the human body. Um, who's next? On our planet, these salts are formed as byproducts of rocket fuel, as well as in road flares and fireworks. Naturally, they only occur in very dry areas. If there are no particular bacteria to break them down, these substances accumulate year after year and their concentration in water is constantly increasing. But in theory, it's possible to purify even such water. The process of filtration could help the astronauts get rid of 90% of harmful substances. Then they could use a UV disinfection unit. This would also help get rid of any foreign molecules, if there are any, that might be hiding in the water. This stage would not only protect the astronauts, but also prevent them from bringing any dormant Martian microbes back to Earth. In other words, future travelers to Mars shouldn't have too many problems with drinking water on the Red Planet, but only if they bring the right purification equipment that can deal with any water quality. Because however bad running out of water in the middle of a desert is, experiencing it on another planet sounds much more terrifying. Anyway, back to terraforming the Red Planet. Once you start thinking about it, some worrying questions arise. Who is supposed to decide whether we should start this process? When should we start it? What if there's some form of life on the Red Planet, like indigenous microbes we haven't spotted yet? And our attempts to change their home will disturb them. What if they don't survive these changes? Now, what do you think? Share your thoughts in the comments. We just can't get enough of Mars, can we? Everyone wants to...
So we have to consider the logistics. Another thing to look out for is caves in the ground that are not necessarily stuck on mountains. Scientists believe that most potential places for humans to thrive are caves. These spaces are large enough to host large populations. So far, they identified nine caves as large as football fields. So what would life look like if we lived in caves on Mars? For one thing, sunlight would be hard to access. By the time we reach Mars, we would have the best technology to maximize our lifespan in a hostile environment, which means withstanding the harsh sun rays of Mars. Most likely, we would dig through the caves further underground where oxygen would be pumped for everyone to breathe. People can walk around casually, thinking they're on Earth, and to exit the caves, you would need to wear a special suit. These cave colonies would have dormitories for people to live in and special spaces for colony meetings, entertainment, grocery markets, schools, and other places that are needed to sustain a colony. There would also be indoor farms to grow crops and raise livestock. A team of experts mapped out what some of the dwellings will look like on Mars. And just like on Earth, we will have apartments for young professionals, family homes, and luxury mansions. Some of the dwelling units would be placed on the surface and not in caves. One of the key elements of the design and architecture is how to build it around the natural light to brighten up the homes. Another element is how to deflect radiation and cosmic rays. Because Mars has such a thin atmosphere, sun rays and other hazardous objects easily enter Mars. The dwelling units also have to be sturdy to protect them from severe dust storms and extreme cold temperatures. Some of the living pods or dwelling units that are for couples or singles would have tunnels leading to a shared workspace and garden. Studies show that even being in the presence of greenery can reduce stress levels significantly. And on the red planet, we would definitely need some greenery. We can expect the family homes to be built within the caves, not necessarily underground. It would be tempting to head outside with the view of Mars, but the large thick glass would prevent anything from coming in and out. Those who are underground with a view rely on LEDs and camera systems to screen the surface landscape of Mars so it acts like real windows. And if you're bored of the surface, you can always switch the channel and watch something else as you please. Maybe a flowing river surrounded by trees, or maybe a penthouse view of all of New York. The choice is yours. There would be a driveway that leads to a garage so one can enter and exit easily. There won't really be a reason to exit the cave colony except probably to visit other cave colonies. In this case, we would have highly crafted vehicles that will take people from colony to colony on the surface. The vehicles can withstand harsh temperatures and would be constantly transporting people daily. Some people might live in a certain colony and have to commute to work every day in other colonies. Humans might not have to be working in dangerous conditions or on the surface. We would have robots that will do that for us. The thing about robots is that they don't need to be human-shaped to do a job. However, before transporting humans to space, we would need to create some human-like robots and land them on Mars. With the exact physical form, we can determine what would happen to people if they were on Mars. We would have robots for specific tasks, helping us with everything. Let's not forget artificial intelligence plays a major role in monitoring the systems and updating the functionalities of the colony. It'll know when certain systems
it needs. Then come the other people who wish to start their life on Mars. People would need entertainment, so musicians would find a place in the colony. We can't expect everyone to go out on a nice sunny day to the beach, but perhaps one day, when the colony is large enough, there can be an artificial body of water with the same elements as the beach. Livestock animals would also be shipped from Earth to be raised on Mars, where they can populate for our nourishment. We can also bring most of the animals and establish a wildlife sanctuary for everyone to enjoy and for the animals to thrive. For now, humans are planning on reaching the red planet sooner than we think. And who knows, maybe you can be one of the first people to sign up and have your own little dwelling unit far away from Earth. Hundreds of spaceships take off from Earth's surface and head toward Mars. Fast forward seven months, and this space fleet of ships is near the red planet. Soon they will all land, and a few thousand people will become citizens of Mars. Perhaps they will never return to their home planet, because there will be absolutely all conditions for a comfortable life here. It takes time and many expeditions to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Here is how, step by step, people might build a full-fledged city there, with factories, hospitals, apartment buildings, and even clubs and restaurants. First, we need to pick a time to launch the rocket. A launch window opens once every 780 days. That's when the distance between Earth and Mars is the shortest. In this case, the journey will take about 6 to 7 months. Let's move to the launch pad. Here, we see the spacecraft connected to a booster rocket. Ignition! The booster sends the spacecraft into the air. It then undocks and lands back on Earth. At the same time, the spacecraft's engines start, and it makes its way to Earth's parking orbit. To make this ascent, the ship has used almost all its fuel and now needs refueling. To do this, we use our booster again. A huge crane places another spacecraft on the booster. There are huge fuel tanks inside the ship. The booster launches from Earth and takes the refueler into orbit. It docks with the spaceship and fills it with fuel. The journey through space may need a total of five such refuelings. And for the first mission to build a colony on Mars, we need five spaceships. So that's about 25 launches from Earth. Considering that the booster costs $230 million, the refueler $130 million, and the ship itself is $200 million, the price tag on the mission is pretty impressive. So, ignition. Fast forward in time, and the first five ships descend to the surface of Mars. These ships haven't brought the first humans. They carry only payloads, like fuel and water supplies, oxygen for breathing, and medical supplies. There are also first living modules, waste management systems, and a huge number of solar panels for generating electricity. Before landing, one of the ships launches a system of satellites into orbit. It'll provide communication on the red planet. So, the robots begin their work on Mars. First, a whole bunch of little rovers line up and unfold solar panels. Their total area reaches the size of seven soccer fields. They're much less efficient on Mars than on Earth. Frequent sandstorms fill the working surface of the panels with sand. But at the same time, the strong winds of the red planet also help to wipe the sand away. Other rovers, equipped with powerful drills, begin searching for water in the Martian soil. When they find water, people will begin producing fuel. We'll combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the mined water at a high temperature and under high pressure. It'll result in getting methane for rockets and oxygen for breathing. Since February 2021, Mars Perseverance rover has been testing the technology for oxygen extraction. It has a box inside. This is the Mars Oxygen IRSU experiment, also called MOXIE. This thing pulls Martian air inside and then, under high pressure, takes one atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. Such a thing, about the size of a shoebox, can provide enough oxygen for one astronaut to breathe. But if you build the same mechanism but the size of a large factory, it'll produce oxygen for an entire colony and release the rest into the atmosphere of Mars. Another group of rovers is working to turn the surface of Mars into a landing zone to prepare for the next step in colonizing the red planet. By this time, the robotic population of Mars has been working on these tasks for two years and two months. And people on Earth have been waiting for a new flight window to open. This time, not five, but 12 spaceships are coming to Mars. Ten of them are cargo ships, 
which bring construction materials, fuel, and other supplies, as well as a lot of scientific equipment and 3D printers. Two other ships carry the first interplanetary astronauts. The doors of the spaceships open, and 30 heroes set foot on the surface of Mars for the first time in history. These people are scientists, engineers, and doctors. They have undergone a strict selection and long training to become the first people to conquer another planet. And these guys don't have a return ticket. They'll have to stay on Mars for two years. The astronauts live right in their spaceships and try to get used to the unusual conditions on Mars. The temperature here is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, the gravity on Mars is two and a half times weaker than on our home planet. That means a person here can jump twice as high and lift heavier objects. But the muscles in human bodies have a hard time getting used to such a difference. So astronauts can't work full time. The first thing they do is unload cargo ships and deploy life support systems. Some people are experimenting with turning Martian soil into material for 3D printers. Others are setting up greenhouses and cultivating soil to grow plants. The human waste recycling system the robots brought here is used to make fertilizer for plants. Two more years and two months have passed. We see a launch of a spaceship, not from Earth, but from Mars. The 30 astronauts have completed their mission and are on their way home. It's easier for spaceships to take off from Mars because the gravitational force here is less powerful. At the same time, ships are launched from Earth. They'll bring nearly 100 new inhabitants and even more cargo to Mars. When this space fleet arrives at the Red Planet, the astronauts can taste the first food grown here. 3D printers begin building homes on Mars. They print outer shells from Martian soil and plant waste. These shells will protect the dwellings from solar radiation and strong winds. And inside the shells, people will build permanent houses. They're inflatable and are equipped with modules brought directly from the spaceships. These houses have living bays, research bays, and communication centers. The construction goes on for two more years until the next flight window opens again. Some astronauts leave Mars, but more and more people come here with every new mission. They no longer live in spaceships. There are comfortable underground houses and 3D printed shelters. Most of the food is already produced on Mars. A new generation of robots works together with farmers. Other robots help to build even more houses to accommodate the ever-increasing human population. Two more years have passed. Various space agencies launch their missions to Mars. There are more people, more scientific equipment, and even tanks with fish. In 2035, Mars and Earth are at a record short distance. So people send a huge fleet of ships with astronauts and construction materials. By this time, the human colony looks like a small city with many interconnected domes. Its inhabitants have already begun building an underground network of tunnels to move between houses, laboratories, and factories. They've also built the first hospital. Two years later, the population of Mars reaches the 1500 mark. Almost all of these people will become permanent residents of the planet. Four years and two more launch windows later, the first restaurant opens its doors. Also, the construction of a nuclear power plant begins. Once it's finished, the Martians will no longer need constant supplies from Earth. From above, the colony looks like a small town. There's a farming section where food is grown, a living section, and a factory district. And with each new mission, people bring more and more solar panels. Now their total area equals dozens of soccer fields. All this allows the astronauts to feel at home. They also don't have to wait for food supplies from Earth. 20 years of the human colony on Mars. Its population is now about 30,000 people. Workers begin to bring their families to Mars. The first schools are built here. 30 years. The population is already over 100,000 people. The colony's infrastructure allows it to be completely self-sufficient. People produce enough food, get enough fuel and oxygen. Around this time, the first plants start growing in Martian soil. There's more and more oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. The trees planted in greenhouses contributed to this. The greenhouse effect from all the human activity helps warm up the surface of Mars, if only a bit. People still have to wear spacesuits when they go outside. It will take many more years until people will be able to breathe on Mars like they do on Earth. Gradually, rivers and lakes will appear. Green plants will cover most of the land. And then the inhabitants of Mars will be able to go outside without an oxygen helmet and call the red planet now green. <laughs>
their home. How about a mysterious object that used to orbit between Mars and Jupiter? At one point in the early days of the solar system, it was destroyed by some catastrophic event. The space body is called Phaeton, and this planet is totally hypothetical. But some people believe that the debris the planet left behind could have formed the asteroid belt. If you like this kind of content, please give it a non-hypothetical like and subscribe. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. Now, at the start of the 19th century, people hadn't discovered the asteroid belt yet. But in 1801, one astronomer spotted the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres. At that time, it was believed that a planet was orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and Ceres seemed to be a suitable candidate. But the next year, another astronomer discovered one more space object with a similar orbit. It was an asteroid that was later named Pallas. These discoveries made scientists conclude that these two objects could have been fragments of the very planet that had once been dwelling between Mars and Jupiter. The following discovery of two more asteroids, Juno and Vesta, seemed to confirm this idea. Only in the 20th century did the hypothetical planet get its name, Phaeton. It was actually a name taken from Greek mythology, meaning Shining One. The hero with this name was the son of the sun deity, Helios, who rode his solar chariot across the sky every day, giving humans the heat and light necessary for survival. One day, Helios allowed Phaeton to drive his chariot. But the sun didn't manage to control the horses. Everything went wrong, and Earth was about to burn down. That's why the main deity, Zeus, had to stop Phaeton with a thunderbolt. The idea of the asteroid belt being the sad result of the planet's destruction was called the disruption theory. And of course, there were several ideas explaining the planet's tragic fate. The most obvious one is that Phaeton was hit by a large space object. It could be another hypothetical body called Nemesis. Some people believe that it's our sun's companion star. According to this theory, the sun has a small companion star that has an extremely elliptical orbit. This orbit periodically brings it close to the Oort cloud, a large sphere of icy objects surrounding the sun. This, in turn, causes a lot of mess. It might be the reason why this hypothetical companion star was also nicknamed the Death Star. It might be a red or brown dwarf. But whatever it is at the furthest point of its orbit, it's believed to be about 1.5 light years away. The search for this star has been in progress for decades. But no one has succeeded in locating this elusive and potentially non-existent space object. Anyway, back to Phaeton. Another theory claims that the planet could have suffered some internal cataclysm which tore it apart. But these days, the disruption theory has fallen out of favor. It was replaced by the accretion theory. According to it, the asteroid belt formed in the process of gradual buildup of particles initially floating in a gaseous environment. With time, they came together to create larger masses. Gravity pulled on these particles, encouraging them to stay together and form planetesimals, tiny planet-like bodies that later form real planets. Planetesimals kept colliding with one another, eventually developing into protoplanets. Such protoplanets grow until they form planetary bodies. As the mass of objects increases, the gravitational forces acting between particles become stronger too, continuing to build gas, dust, and ice within the nebular disk. It all has a snowball effect where the increase in mass results in more particles getting involved in the process. Eventually, there's no building material left, and large space objects float in the darkness of space. Now, many experts think that the asteroid belt is the remains of the protoplanetary disk which had once been orbiting the Sun before the planets formed. Unfortunately, it never had a chance to coalesce into a planet because Jupiter's gravitational effect prevented it from happening. In any case, even though Phaeton's was a good story, it's not popular anymore. The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their escape pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. 
The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, 
because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So, you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface but nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. Whew. It's just a regular day. As usual, you're taking a shower before starting to get ready for work. Everything is going as planned. Until it isn't. One clumsy move, some water spilled on the floor, and you're flapping your arms in the air, your body nearing the floor with frightening speed. Everything goes black first thing you hear is a high-pitched whining in your head. Ouch, your head! Ugh. You carefully get up. There's no blood, and that's good. An even better thing is that the annoying noise stops abruptly. Holding your head, you leave the bathroom and almost stumble over your cat, Milo. He hisses, and then a clear voice in your head says, Clumsy loser. Huh? You whip your head around in fear. But you see no one. It's just you and Milo. You've probably hit your head more than you thought. You shrug and make your way to the kitchen. Milo follows you. You hear ceaseless grumbling. Why can he sleep in the bedroom and I'm banned from there? Why haven't I gotten my meal yet? This leather creature's too lazy. Shall I scratch the sofa or leave a mouse on his pillow? The first thought that comes to your mind is, we have mice in the house? The second is more relevant. I'm losing my marbles. Great! Acting on autopilot, you pour some milk into Milo's bowl and fill another one up with some dry food. The cat doesn't seem to be satisfied with how fast you are. If his, oh for goodness sake, move it, man, is anything to go by. Okay, now you'll have to live with the knowledge that your beloved cat Milo actually has the personality of a grumpy old man. Duh. 
you decide to lock yourself in the bathroom again because you're starting to get overwhelmed. You sit down heavily on the toilet lid and almost jump a foot in the air when you hear someone arguing loudly. After looking around, you find out that, apparently, there are not only mice, but also cockroaches in your house. Just great. At the moment, you're staring at a couple of these insects, which seem to be having a fight. At least, one of them is accusing the other of... Wait, what? Cheating? You've heard enough. You're about to dash out of the bathroom when you hear a bang. In the living room, you find your cat on the floor under a smashed flower pot. The worst thing? He seems to be really hurt. He won't stop whimpering and meowing. Ugh, it hurts! It hurts! My paw! Ouch! Ouch! But the sofa can't remain unscratched today. You grab Milo, shove him into the carrier. Hey, watch out, you leather bag! And head for the clinic. On the way, you have to concentrate hard to block out the noise of countless voices assaulting you. The waiting area at the vet is full. Uh-oh, you're in for a long wait. Half an hour later, your head is ready to explode. You found out that that yellow python is suspiciously interested in the hamster a girl in the corner is clutching to her chest. So fat, so pretty. The hamster's worried about his stash of nuts. Where did I hide them? Where, where, where? A tiny dog that has come with an elderly lady is anxious about needles. If that shop thingy comes near me once again, they'll regret it. I'll destroy everyone on my way. Finally, it's your turn. The vet invites you to her office, and you bend to pick up Milo when a desperate-looking young man bursts into the room. My puppy! What's wrong with him? The vet looks at you apologetically, but you're focused on the puppy. It looks weak, but you manage to figure out the words, Chocolate! Yum! When you tell the vet and the anxious owner that the pooch has eaten some chocolate, which is basically poison for dogs, they give you a funny look and disappear into the doctor's office. Sometime later, the guy exits, holding the dog that looks way better than before. When they leave, the vet turns to you. How did you figure out the dog had eaten chocolate? Uh-oh, here it comes. You decide that honesty is the best strategy and tell the vet that you can understand what animals say. Of course she doesn't believe you. You have to try hard to persuade her. But with the help of two other dogs, Milo and an elderly squirrel, you manage to make her believe you. When you get back home, your head is spinning and you're pretty hungry. All you can think about is some fried eggs and bacon. Yum. Wait, bacon? But it's... Uh Uh-oh. Apparently, starting today, you're a vegan. Anyway, that's when it starts. You don't know how it happens, but you become famous overnight. The next morning, a loud noise wakes you up, and it doesn't sound like animals talking to you. You look out of the window and see crowds of people gathered around your house. Some of them are reporters, but others are pet owners that have come to ask you for help. Milo is not happy. While grumbling nonstop and calling you names, he bites your leg and retreats under the stairs. And you go out of your house to talk to people and answer the reporter's questions. In the evening, you're exhausted, but also happy. You've saved several animals today. They had serious health and psychological problems their owners couldn't figure out on their own. Lying in bed in the dark, you think of how you can use your ability. That's when your plan takes shape. Soon, you become the most renowned animal care specialist in the world. You listen to animals talking about their problems, talk them out of depression, and help them resolve misunderstandings with their owners. TV shows invite you for interviews. Your YouTube channel is growing every day. People recognize you on the street and ask you to take pictures with them. You travel the world, help endangered species, and give lectures. You open vet clinics all over the globe and invite the best professionals to work there. You never feel lonely. There's always someone to talk to or listen to. 
at least some birds when you're walking in the park, or some fish when you're having a rare moment of rest on the beach. At the same time, you've come to realize how many animals are begging for help, but no one can hear them. You decide to take up the role of their speaker. It turns out you're now famous not only in the human world, but also in the world of animals. They're grateful, and in return, they start informing you of different natural disasters that are about to happen on the planet. You've heard that animals can predict earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. And if before, people had to try hard to notice some unusual behavior of certain species, now animals just pass you information about what's going to happen and where. With time, you notice that you spend less time among people and more time with animals. Together, you plan campaigns against zoos, circuses, and other places where animals are kept against their will. And then, one day, the unthinkable happens. You're returning home when a black van stops next to you. A few big masked guys grab you and push you inside. The doors close behind your back. Inside, you find out that several influential people aren't happy with your activity. You realize that this trip isn't going to end well. The guys blindfold you and lead you somewhere. But at one moment, you lose your footing and hit your head on something hard. You open your eyes. Milo is standing over you, looking at your lying body rather indifferently. And then the most terrible thing happens. He meows what sounds like a whole sentence, turns away, and walks out of the bathroom. And you don't understand a meow of what he's saying. Was it all just a dream? So Barry is running along the shore of a lake as fast as possible. He knows that if he stops, his life will turn into a nightmare in no time. A thousand mosquitoes are about to bite him. But what he doesn't know is that he'll be okay after all. So don't be afraid, Barry, and stop. Mosquitoes are slow. They fly at a little more than one mile per hour. (laughs) And you can't run forever. So after a couple of hours of pointless running, Barry stops. He sweats and emits a smell attractive to insects. One little mosquito flies up to him. It buzzes next to his ear, sits on his sweaty neck, and bites. The insect pierces the skin with a special mouth apparatus called a proboscis. The mosquito starts pumping blood through this needle. Its saliva gets into Barry's body and causes an allergic reaction. More precisely, it's Barry's immune system that starts this reaction. It perceives the mosquito's saliva as an enemy and sends a unique chemical substance to the bite site. The fight between this substance and the invader causes an allergic reaction redness, swelling, and the worst thing, itching. Barry can scratch himself for several hours or even days. It all depends on how his body will react to the bite. The mosquito fills up with Barry's blood and flies away. It does it not for pleasure, but because it needs to lay eggs. Protein in the blood is necessary for these insects to reproduce. Their eggs can't grow without this substance. Yeah, almost all biting mosquitoes are female. Male mosquitoes prefer plant and flower nectar. Hey, they're guys. So the female mosquito flies away from Barry. She sits down on the shore of the lake where a large mosquito base is located. Here, these insects lay eggs, drink water, and chill in the sun. There are several hundred thousand of them, and they're all hungry. The female mosquito brings with her the smell of Barry sweat, which is attractive to the rest of the mosquitoes, too. There are about 3,500 species of these insects on Earth. Some of them love the smell of sugar, perfume, or deodorant. And some enjoy the smell of dirty feet. Mm. Now, your attractiveness to mosquitoes also depends on what you have eaten today. Lots of candies and chocolate? Great! Now, mosquitoes feel a faint sweet smell coming from you. Have you eaten garlic and onions? Mosquitoes probably won't want to deal with you. And not only they, most likely. (laughs) So, the smell of berry sweat is perfect for all mosquitoes on the shore. They go mad, take off, and head for the poor guy. 
If you walk near the water when the evening comes, if you're sweaty, wearing black clothes, and have O-type blood, then you have all the chances to get bitten by mosquitoes. And Barry meets all the criteria. The first mosquitoes land on Barry's feet. They bite him and start pumping blood. One tiny mosquito can draw a droplet of blood the size of a half a grain of rice. It's nothing at all. But several dozen of these bites? It's bad. Barry fights mosquitoes off with his hands, but the insects keep coming. They can't miss such a delicious dinner. 10, 20, 50, 100 mosquitoes. They cover Barry's legs. The skin swells and turns red. Barry feels a burning sensation. His immune system is working at 100%, trying to reduce the damage and drive the enemies away. But the more actively Barry's body defenses work, the worse he feels. Mosquitoes sit on his hands and on his wet t-shirt stuck to his body. Yes, their mouthpiece can pierce a thin layer of fabric. Barry tries to run away. He stumbles over a rock and falls. Some insects finish their feast and fly away to tell their friends about the free food. Mosquitoes from all over the lake come to try Barry. 200 mosquitoes are drinking his blood. 3, 5, 7, 900. Now, 1,000 mosquitoes have bitten him. Together, they have pumped out a small glass of blood. But the worst thing is, they continue biting him. Nothing can stop them now, even though they were supposed to bite him only a thousand times. Well, the only chance to escape is water. Barry, ignoring the itch, gets up and runs to the shore of the lake. Meanwhile, 100,000 mosquitoes have already bitten him. Sorry, Barry, but we have to entertain the audience. Don't worry, your recovery will be fast. He's getting closer and closer to the water. Mosquitoes are flying in front of his face, so he can't see the road. But Barry keeps running, waving his hands. Meanwhile, you know this moment when you're sleeping and one mosquito flies into the room through the window? Just one. But its squeaky sound is so annoying. And now, imagine a million mosquitoes making this noise. It's like a saxophone playing high notes. Sorry if you're a sax player. Well, Barry is slowing down. He's exhausted, and his heart is beating too fast. He no longer feels bites and itches. His body is becoming weak, but he's still moving toward the lake. Mosquitoes have already taken three soda cans of blood from him. And this is serious. Barry is running a fever and has clouded consciousness. His immune system is not coping. Barry can't run anymore. He's struggling to walk. It's getting harder to make every next step. The shore is only a few feet away, but it doesn't matter anymore since he has no energy to move. So he just sits on the grass and accepts the situation. He's lost a large soda bottle of blood, and this is a lot. This is probably the most large-scale attack of mosquitoes on humans. And then, at the very last moment, salvation appears. A frog croaks nearby, and another one. Several dozen jumping animals are approaching the shore. They release their tongues like spears and catch mosquitoes. This gives Barry hope. He makes a last-ditch effort to reach the lake. He jumps in. Yeah! What a relief! Cold, fresh water envelops his whole body and relieves the itching and irritation from the bites. He waits in the water while the frogs dine on the mosquitoes. The remaining insects fly away. Barry crawls out of the lake. He sees frogs catching mosquitoes and realizes that these annoying insects are necessary for our planet. Frogs live thanks to these tiny monsters. And besides frogs, there are many other animals that feed on mosquitoes. Lizards, spiders, bats, birds, turtles, it's a huge list. Mosquitoes are an endless source of food for them. One pair can lay 200 eggs. They grow fast and their lives are short. But if all these insects disappear, an ecological catastrophe may begin. Entire animal species may vanish from the face of the earth. The frogs that save Barry wouldn't exist. Without frogs, the population of other insects, like flies, would begin to grow. They would reproduce uncontrollably. And then, like falling dominoes, other problems will follow. So, Barry, don't be angry at mosquitoes. It's just nature. You better deal with your itchy problem. His whole body is red, covered with little bumps. He starts scratching himself, but this doesn't help. He only makes it worse. 
As long as mosquito saliva remains in his body and the immune system fights it, Barry will feel this itch. Fortunately, there are many oils and ointments to alleviate these effects. But the best way to get rid of the problem is to ignore it. Barry just needs to distract himself with something. Then the urge to scratch will disappear. Barry has survived so many mosquito bites without harmful consequences. But some people have problems dealing with just one. It depends on whether a person has allergies. Some have a small itchy bump, and others have severe inflammation. As for Barry, wasn't he swell? I mean, didn't he swell? (laughs) Okay, I'll stop. The best way to protect yourself is to use insect spray. Now, Barry sprays himself with this substance before every run and feels safe. But let's have a look at another situation. What if Barry gets attacked by huge dogs? Hey, just kidding. Relax, Barry. Hello, and welcome to the Survive No Matter What show. Today, our host, Alberto, will perform a crazy trick. Last year, he lived in a cave with a grizzly bear for two months and managed to survive. Do you remember how Alberto smeared himself with minced meat and jumped into a pool with piranhas? I hope you haven't forgotten how Alberto grilled a barbecue on an awakened volcano. Well, forget it. Today, Alberto will do the most dangerous and crazy trick in his life. Especially for you, dear viewers, he will get swallowed by a giant blue whale. Alberto goes to the North Atlantic. It's a vast area of water where you can meet blue whales and cachalots. He gets on a yacht and sails far from the shore. He's going to look for whales using echolocation and binoculars. A few days have passed. Alberto sits on board and studies the horizon. The sonar detects some movement. He looks toward the signal and sees a water fountain rising into the sky. It's a giant blue whale, the largest mammal on the planet. Yes, it's a mammal, not a fish. So, Alberto smears himself with oil to easily squeeze into the whale's throat. He takes an oxygen mask and jumps into the water. The blue whale opens its mouth and absorbs a massive amount of water. Its mouth is filled with whalebone. These are the bristles that replace teeth. They consist of keratin protein. People's hair and nails are made of it. The whale draws in water and then pushes it out. The bristles prevent small fish and plankton from leaving the mouth along with the liquid. Whalebone is like a filter. Alberto swims closer. The whale takes a sip. It absorbs several dozen gallons of water and sucks up Alberto. Our hero is inside the storm. The water splashes in different directions, and a giant tongue the size of an elephant throws Alberto on different sides. Alberto tries to get to the throat, but the water splashes back out. Alberto slides along the tongue to the mouth's exit, but the whale closes his mouth and he crashes into the whalebone. It's a little painful. A couple of bristles even fall off. The tongue wants to push him out, but Alberto manages to squeeze into its throat. But here, he meets a block. He can't go further because of the structure of the whale. This colossal animal's throat is tiny, the size of a fist, but it can stretch. Alberto had foreseen this. That's why he smeared himself with oil. He stretches out to his full height and jumps into the throat. Now our hero finds himself inside a narrow esophagus. He slides on it like a slide in a water park. Then his speed decreases. The space becomes narrower. Now Alberto is crawling forward with difficulty. It's very slippery here, and Alberto can barely move. The esophagus contracts and pushes Alberto further. Now he's inside the stomach. It's dark, cramped, and smells awful. Alberto wants to light a match, but his pockets are entirely wet. And it's a bad idea to make a fire here. Firstly, there's almost no oxygen, which means no chance for a fire. Secondly, various chemical reactions occur inside the stomach, creating explosive gases. Alberto doesn't want that. He takes out a flashlight and examines the place. The walls of the stomach are narrow and constantly pulsating. Alberto can't stand up to his full height. He's knee deep in some liquid. He sees skeletons of fish, shipwrecks, supermarket baskets, DVDs, a lamp, and a Moby Dick book around him. No, that's not true, as you're unlikely to find anything interesting inside a whale's stomach. Maybe a plastic bottle or some small squid. 
By the way, a cachalot, unlike a blue whale, has a wide and long throat. This allows it to swallow large prey whole. Technically, it can swallow a human with one sip. Anyway, you can find many exciting things in the cachalot's stomach. Once, this creature swallowed a giant squid whole. The length of these squids can reach 46 feet. That's the size of a small bus. But the cachalot managed to swallow such prey thanks to the flexible structure of the squid's body. Okay, now let's get back to Alberto. There's a terrible smell in the whale's stomach. Plankton and small fish are digested in gastric juice. And, wait, why does it hurt so much? Alberto feels the stomach juice splitting his suit. Alberto tries to get up, but it's too crowded in here. He hits the stomach walls with his hands, but nothing happens. The stomach narrows and squeezes Alberto more and more. The juice irritates his skin. Alberto shouts and waves his legs in different directions. He wants to cause a gag reflex, but it doesn't work. Alberto is desperate, and he doesn't know what to do. It seems that this is his last adventure. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Stop! A deep breath! Precisely! Alberto opens the oxygen tank and fills the stomach with fresh air. Now the whale begins to bloat and is filled with gas. The stomach is throbbing, the juice is foaming, and it seems a storm is coming. The walls contract so much that they squeeze Alberto out through the esophagus. Together with the remains of fish and juice, he moves forward. The esophagus is getting narrower. Alberto finds it hard to breathe, but he sees the light at the end of the tunnel. The whale spits him out. Alberto is alive. He's happy that he managed to escape such an adventure unharmed. He returns to the boat and sails to the shore. But wait a minute. What's that swimming by right now? It's a cachalot. What a stroke of luck. Alberto dives into the water again. He's heading straight for the mouth of this huge animal. The cachalot absorbs water. Several fish and an octopus get there along with Alberto. The cachalot pushes him with its tongue in different directions and swallows all the prey. The throat is wide enough and Alberto easily manages to get there. But there's another problem. Alberto is already in a very tight esophagus where he can hardly breathe. And he doesn't have an oxygen tank. Alberto feels like he's been wrapped tightly in duct tape. He can't do anything, and there's no air here. He squeezes deep into the esophagus and feels that he is not alone here. In addition to the octopus, he feels the movements of large tentacles. Wow, it's a giant squid, and it seems it's still alive. Alberto shakes his whole body, but can't change anything. He loses consciousness. The stomach walls are pressing on his face. At this point, Alberto bites it. An earthquake begins. All that lay in the stomach comes out. Finally, Alberto is outside. A colossal squid swims away as far as possible. It seems it hasn't understood what happened to it. Our hero climbs onto the yacht. He's the happiest person on the planet right now. He starts the engine and heads to the shore. You must understand that Alberto's story is purely hypothetical. Of course, in reality, a whale wouldn't be able to swallow a human. Reports that a person ended up in a whale's stomach are overgrown with myths and legends. Yes, there were cases when people got into their giant mouths, but they didn't go through the throat. One day a diver got there, but he miraculously survived thanks to scuba diving equipment that helped him breathe. Another case occurred with people who were kayaking. When a humpback whale catches fish, it swims up to the surface with its mouth open. It's like a grid that rises from below. Those guys on the kayaks were too close and fell into the whale's mouth. Anyway, don't worry, a whale can't swallow you. It's impossible, but it is possible for a cachalot. The good news is that this is a rare animal. The probability of getting into its stomach is one in a billion. It's more likely that a meteorite will fall near you. Most people on Earth will never see a cachalot in real life. These animals swim worldwide in open oceans, but spend most of their time at a depth of about 10,000 feet. That's 10 times the height of the Eiffel Tower, but just in the ocean. You're on vacation, taking a trip to the family estate set in the cold Scottish Highlands. An old ruined castle sits alone, a token of your family's heritage. You spent your childhood in the nearby forest chasing squirrels, and through adulthood, you have enjoyed walking every acre of it. There's always something new to be found. 
As you walk the millionth time through the trees, you find a small stone building. It's half covered in dirt and overgrown grass. Curious, you've never seen this before. You dig away at the dirt and pull away the grass, eager to learn what's within. You find a small, weather-worn door, large enough for a dog. Maybe it's a royal doghouse. You pull the old door and look inside. It's a small room with nothing in it except for an old sack. You grab the sack, taking a closer look, trying to identify the fabric. But wait a minute, there's something inside of it. You look inside and find an egg about the size of an ostrich. Hmm, dogs don't lay eggs. Looking at the egg closely, you notice it's very old and heavier than you expected. You shake it gently, feeling the sensation of liquid inside. Suddenly, you feel some energy coming from it. Shocked, you attempt to throw the egg away but stop yourself. For some reason, you feel a sense of longing towards the egg, as though it belongs to you. You hold it close, protecting it, and carry it back to the homestead. You sit by the egg, lying on the kitchen table, waiting and expecting something to happen. Your eyes become heavy, and slowly they close. Just as your eyelids touch, the egg wriggles slightly. You open your eyes in response, but the egg remains still. Did I imagine it? It wriggles again and again, and now it's constantly shaking. The egg rolls around on the table, cracks begin appearing, and something inside is hitting the shell with great ferocity, desperate to be released. Finally, the shell breaks open with an almighty thrust from the small resident. It stands with its arms stretched into the air and squeals out to the world, I am free! You look towards what should be a bird of some sort, but this is a very strange bird. Four legs, wings, reptile skin. Ah, it's a dragon. Wait, what? A dragon? Yes, a dragon. It says to you after reading your thoughts. How? What? You're struggling to find your words. You are the descendant of these holdings, are you not? You nod, confused even more because it can speak. As per the decree of 1061, we few that are laid within an egg are loyal to the caretaker side. You look at one another. The dragon is definitely waiting for some response. You are so confused, you can't utter a word. Have you chosen a name for me to which I am to respond? Ah, a name. Right, um, I will call you Dog. Dog responds by bowing honorably. It is a worthy name I hope to bring glory to. Glory? Um, I don't understand why you're here, though. Why now? Dog explains that when elements of magic within the air react, it creates a perfect environment for dragon eggs to hatch. From a scientific perspective, changes within the Earth's atmosphere could probably explain all this. Whether it's the temperature, hydrogen levels, or changes in the ocean, it's impossible to determine. You accept that it's just magic. Exhausted by the events, you head to bed. The following morning, you awake, expecting to see Dog waiting for you. He's nowhere to be found. You go outside. It's all very quiet. No birds are singing. The distant sheep are also quiet. Suddenly, Dog flies down. He's grown to the size of a cow. He's grown way too fast, though you think you know why. You try not to imagine what he's been up to. First lesson, human, get on. Dog positions himself to allow you onto his back. You don't question him, trusting that he knows what he's doing. Without warning, he begins to run fast toward an open clearing, just like an airplane, as he gathers enough speed. With the force of the wind, you both take off. You speed through the air, gaining altitude. You hold on tight. Passing through near misses between trees, Dog makes immediate turns, and you wish you were safely on the ground. You can hear Dog's voice within your head. You will act as my eyes as well, watching from where I cannot. Um, I see trees all around. There are some hills in the dist- Not now! Dog interrupts. You will look out for danger, not observe the scenery. You are flying for some hours, and you have no idea where you might be. You're too concerned about hanging on, and it's cold. You should have brought warmer clothes. Now jump! You jump without hesitation, trusting Dog's orders, but you quickly regret this move as you fall to the ground. The distant trees below are quickly becoming larger. Spread your arms out and grab on! Dog pulls in beneath. You land on top of him and grasp him immediately. Good job! We only get one try at that trick. Dog laughs. You safely land in a landscape you're unfamiliar with. Fetch some wood. We'll make camp. Annoyed at taking orders from what's meant to be your dragon, you respectfully go to collect wood as Dog flies away. You collect a good pile, all stacked neatly. 
dog lands with a sudden thud next to it. He doesn't acknowledge your hard work and starts it up with one puff. He lays peacefully and drifts off to sleep, snoring loudly straight away. You enjoy the warmth, but it's still uncomfortable on the ground. You feel it would be appropriate to lay next to dog, and he gives you a flick of his tail. Oh, man! With his eyes still closed, he grumbles, I am not furniture, I am a dragon, and goes back to sleep. You lay down elsewhere and drift off to sleep uncomfortably. As you wake up the next morning, there's hardly any warmth coming from the charcoal remains. Dog is nowhere to be found. Not surprised, you sigh, worst dragon ever. Dog arrives in his classic unexpected style and throws you some cooked meat. You don't ask where he got it. Best not to know. Eat well. Today is our biggest task. Danger approaches. Dog stands looking out towards the unknown. You eat your meal, enjoying the little something this partnership has provided. You look up and notice that Dog's size has grown twice as large overnight. You gather to his back and climb up. His wings are so large now, he doesn't need a runway and takes flight without warning. Be on the lookout today. Today is the day. As Dog rushes forward, you ask, what day? Just be focused, Dog yells. Together, you fly north. The air is cooler, but Dog's body warmth is greater today. Dark clouds form in the distance. Flying closer, you can see things in the distance, unsure to make out what they are. Dog realizes your concern. Ice boils. What? The same magic that allowed me to hatch brought them from the ice. They will want to turn the world frozen. Only we can stop them. You're concerned as you observe their numbers. There might be dozens, if not hundreds, and possibly more hiding in the clouds behind them. As you approach, Dog speeds toward them, fending them on, breathing fire and biting. You hold on tight, trying to avoid the sharp ends of their wings. Their numbers are too many. Dog is becoming overwhelmed. An ice coil from overhead speeds down, targeting Dog, realizing he's unable to do anything as he's facing several of those at once. You leap towards it. You hit it in midair. It's like hitting a stone wall. You make no effect apart from distracting it. It flicks you away and you fall. Dog sees you, but he's unable to help, so he cries out to you. You fall helpless to the ground. I've got you. You can hear a girl's voice. She grabs you by the arm, pulling you onto another dragon. You smile and then turn around to see that there isn't just one, but dozens more, all flying to save Dog. The group of dragons targets the ice coils, rescuing Dog. Then they turn to defeat the remaining ice coils. Regardless of the number of ice coils, the dragon force easily defeats them. The remaining flee even further north. The dragons and their riders land together, gathering to meet one another. Dog abruptly lands next to you. You turn to the girl that saved you. Do you get along with your dragon? You ask. What do you mean? We're best friends. She laughs and hugs her dragon. Good for 